Hi guys, it's Mr. Philosophist checking in um, on this windy Friday morning. I know it sucks that we're all stuck in our houses and there's not a ton to do, but I thought that I would record a read aloud for you guys. Um, I hope that everybody's doing good. We're going to post this video and some videos to follow to the Kelfis YouTube page. So if you like it, send a comment. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from as many kids as possible. <clears throat> so the book that I'm going to read aloud today, or at least start reading aloud today, is a book that I started with my class um, this year, and I know that a lot of the kids in my book clubs were working on it. Um, the reason I chose this book is I think it was the most popular book out of the book clubs in my class, and a lot of you guys had gotten started with it, but nobody finished, um, and so I thought I would pick it up for you. Um, so, if you know me at all, you know that I really, really, really love the book called Hatchet. Um, so I'm going to be posting um, videos for each chapter of Hatchet. I have it on my screen right here, so um, I'm going to read it and record it for you. I hope that you enjoy it. Hatchet by Gary Paulson, Chapter 1 Ryan Robeson stared out the window of the small plane at the endless green northern wilderness below. It was a small plane, a Cessna 406, a bush plane. And the engine was so loud, so roaring and consuming and loud that it ruined any chance for conversation. Not that he had much to say. He was 13 and the only passenger on the plane with a pilot named, what was it? Jim or Jake or something, who was in his mid-40s and who had been silent as he worked to prepare for takeoff. In, in feet since Brian had come to the small airport in Hampton, New York to meet the plane, driven by his mother, the pilot had spoken only five words to him, get in the co-pilot seat, which Brian had done. They had taken off and that was the last of the conversation. There had been the initial excitement, of course. He had never flown in a single engine plane before. And to be sitting in the co-pilot seat with all the controls right there in front of him, all the instruments in his face, as the plane clawed for altitude, jerking and sliding on the wind currents as the pilot took off. It had been interesting and exciting. But in five minutes, they had leveled off at 6,000 feet and headed northwest, and from then on, the pilot had been silent, staring out the front, and the drone of the engine had been all that was left. The drone in the sea of green trees that lay before the pilot's nose and flowed to the horizon, spread with the lakes, swamps, and wandering streams and rivers. Now Brian sat looking out the window with the roar thundering through his ears, and he tried to catalog what had led up for him taking this flight. The thinking started. It always started with one single word, divorce. It was an ugly word, he thought, a tearing, ugly word. It meant fights and yelling, lawyers. God, he thought, how he hated lawyers who sat with their comfortable smiles and tried to explain to him in legal terms how all that he lived in was coming apart. And the breaking and shattering of all the solid things, his home, his life, all the solid things, divorce. A breaking word, an ugly word, divorce, and secrets. No, not secrets so much as just the secret. What he knew and what he had not told anybody. What he knew about his mother that had caused the divorce. What he knew, what he knew. The secret, divorce, and the secret. Brian felt his eyes beginning to bum and burn, and he knew that there would be tears. He had cried for a time, but that was gone now. He didn't cry now. Instead, his eyes burned and tears came. The seeping tears that burned, but he didn't cry. He just wiped his eyes with a finger and he looked at the pilot out of the corner of his eye to make sure that he didn't notice the burning and the tears. The pilot sat large, his hands lightly on the wheel. Feet on the rudder pedals, he seemed more of a machine than a man, an extension of the airplane. On the dashboard in front of him, Brian saw dials, switches, meters, knobs, levers, cranks, lights, handles that were wiggling and flickering, all indicating that nothing that he understood. 
and the pilots seemed the same way, part of the plane, not even human. When he saw Brian look at him, the pilot seemed to open up a bit, and he smiled. Ever fly in a co-pilot seat before? He leaned over and lifted the headset off of his right ear and put it down to his temple, yelling to overcome the sound of the engine. Brian shook his head. He had never been in any kind of plane. He had never seen a cockpit of a plane before, except in movies or on TV. It was loud and it was confusing. First time. It's not as complicated as it looks. A good plane like this, it almost flies itself, the pilot shrugged. My job is easy. He took Brian's left arm. Here, put your hands on the controls, your feet on the rudder pedals, and I'll show you what I mean. Brian shook his head. I better not. Sure, try it. Brian reached out and took the wheel in a grip, so tight that his knuckles were white. He pushed his feet down on the pedals. The plane slewed slightly to the right. Not so hard. Take her light. Take her light, Brian eased off. Relaxed his grip. The burning in his eyes was forgotten momentarily as the vibration of the plane came through the wheel and the pedals. It seemed almost alive. See? The pilot let go of his wheel. Raised his hand in the air and took his feet off. The pedals to show that Brian, to show Brian that he was actually flying the plane alone. Simple. Now turn the wheel a little to the right and push the right rudder pedal a small amount. Brian turned his wheel slightly and the plane immediately banked to the right. When he pressed on the right rudder pedal, the nose slid across the horizon to the right. He let, he let off of it and he straightened the wheel and the plane righted itself. Now you can turn. Bring her back to the left a little. Brian turned the wheel left, pushed on the left pedal, and the plane came back around. It's easy, he smiled, at, at least this part. The pilot nodded. All of flying is easy. Just takes learning, like everything else, like everything else. He took the controls back, then he reached up and rubbed his left shoulder. Aches and pains. Must be getting old. Brian let go of the controls and moved his feet away from the pedals as the pilot put his hands on the wheel. Thank you. The pilot had put his headset back on, and the gratitude was lost, and the engine noise, and things went back to Brian looking out the window at the ocean of trees and lakes. The burning eyes did not come back, but the memories did. They came flooding in. The words, always the same words. Divorce. The secret. Fights. Split. The big split. Brian's father did not understand as Brian did. He knew only that Brian's mother wanted to break their marriage apart. The split had come and then the divorce all so fast. And the courts had left him with his mother except for in the summertime. And what the judge called visitation rights. It was so formal. Brian hated judges as he hated lawyers. Judges that leaned over the bench and asked Brian if he understood where he was going to live and why. Judges who did not know what really happened? Judges with a caring look that meant nothing. As lawyers said legal phrases, that meant nothing. In the summer, Brian would live with his father. And during the school year, he would live with his mother. That's what the judge said after looking at the papers on his desk and listening to the lawyers talk. Talk. Words. Now the plane lurched slightly to the right, and Brian looked at the pilot. He went from rubbing his shoulder again. And there was a sudden smell of body gas in the plane. Brian turned back to avoid embarrassing the pilot, who was obviously in some serious discomfort. Must have had stomach troubles. So this summer, the, the first summer when he was allowed to have visitation rights with his father, with the divorce only one month old, Brian was heading north. His father was a mechanical engineer who was designed, or he had invented a new drill bit for oil drilling. It was a self-cleaning, self-sharpening drill bit. He was working in the oil fields of Canada, up on the tree line where the tundra started and the forests ended. Brian lived in New York, and he was riding up from New York with some drill uh, drilling equipment. It was lashed down in the rear of the plane next to the fabric bag that the pilot had called a survival pack, which had emergency supplies in case they had to make an emergency landing. That had to be a special that had to be specialty made in a city 
riding in a bush plane with a pilot named Jim or Jake or something who had turned to be out an all right guy. He even let him fly the plane and all, except for the smell. Now there was a constant odor, and Brian took another look at the pilot. He found him rubbing the shoulder down the arm now. Down his left arm, letting go more gas and wincing. Probably something that he ate, Brian thought. His mother had driven him from the city to meet the plane at Hampton, where it came to pick up the drilling equipment. A drive that lasted in silence. A long drive in silence. Two and a half hours of just sitting in the car, staring out the window, just as he was now staring out the window of the plane. Once after an hour, when they were out of the city, she turned to him. Look, can't we just talk this over? Can't we talk this out? Can't you tell me what's bothering you? And there were the words again. Divorce. Split. The secret. How could he tell her what he knew? So he had remained silent, shook his head, and continued to stare, unseeing at the countryside, and his mother had gone back to driving only to speak to him one more time when they were close to the airport. She reached over to the back of the seat of the car, and she brought up a paper bag. I got something for you, for the trip. Brian took the paper bag, and he opened the top. Inside, there was a hatchet the kind with a steel handle and a rubber hand grip. The head was in a stout leather case that had a brass riveted belt loop. It goes on your belt, his mother spoke now without looking at him. There were some farm trucks on the road and she had to weave through them and watch traffic. The man at the store said you could use it, you know, in the woods with your father, dad he thought. Not my father. His name's Dad. Thanks. It's really nice. But the words sounded hollow, even to Brian. Try it on. See how it looks on your belt. And he normally would have said no. He normally would have said that it looked too corny to have a hatchet on your belt. Those were the things that he would say. But her voice was thin, and it sounded like something that that would break if you touched it. And he felt bad for not speaking to her, knowing what he knew. Even with the anger, even with the white-hot hate and anger at his mom, he still felt bad for not talking to her. So, to make her happy, he loosened his belt, he pulled on the right side of it, and he put the hatchet on and re-threaded the belt around his waist. Scooch around so I can see it. He moved around in the seat, feeling only slightly ridiculous. She nodded. Just like a scout. My little scout. And there was the tenderness in her voice that she had when he was small, and the tenderness that she had when he was small and sick with a cold. And she put her hand on his forehead, and the burning came into his eyes again, and he turned away from her, and he looked out the window, forgotten the hatchet on his belt, So and so arrived at the plane at the airport with the hatchet still hooked to his belt. Because it was a bush plane, it was in a small airport. There had been no security, and the plane had just been waiting for him, with the engine running. When he arrived, he grabbed his suitcase and his backpack, and he ran for the plane without stopping to remove the hatchet. So it was still on his belt. At first, he had been embarrassed, but the pilot didn't say anything about it, and Brian forgot as they took off and began flying. More smell now. Bad. Brian turned again and glanced at the pilot, who had both hands on his stomach and was grimacing in the pain reaching for the left shoulder again as Brian watched. I don't know, kid. The pilot's words were a hiss. He could barely even hear him. Bad aches here. Bad aches. I thought it was something I ate, but... He stopped, and a fresh spasm of pain hit him. Even Brian could see how bad it was. The pain drove the pilot back into his seat. Back and down. I've never had anything like this. The pilot reached for the switch on his mic cord, his hand coming off a small arc from his stomach, and he flipped the switch and said, This is flight 46. And now a jolt took him like a hammer blow, so forcefully that he seemed to crush back into a seat. And Brian reached for him. He couldn't understand what it was at first. He could not know. And then he knew. Brian knew. The pilot's mouth went rigid. He swore and he jerked in a short series of slams into the seat. 
holding his shoulder now. He swore and he hissed. Oh my God, my chest, my chest, my chest is coming apart. Brian knew nothing. But then it popped into his head. The pilot was having a heart attack. Brian had been in a shopping mall one time with his mom when a man in front of the Paisley store had suffered a heart attack. He'd gone down on the floor and he screamed about his chest. He was an old man, much older than this pilot. Brian knew the pilot was having a heart attack. And even as the knowledge came to Brian, he saw the pilot slam into the seat one more time. One more awful time. He slammed back into his seat and his right leg jerked pulling the plane to the side in a sudden twist, and his head fell forward, and split came. Spit came out of his mouth, out of the corners of his mouth, and his legs contracted up, up into the seat, and then his eyes rolled back into his head, until Brian could only see the whites. Only white for eyes, and the smell became worse. It filled the cockpit, it filled the plane, and all of a sudden, so fast, so incredibly fast, that Brian's mind could not take it at first. He could only see it in stages. The pilot had been talking just a minute ago, complaining of the pain. He had been talking, then the jolts came. The jolts that took the pilot back had come, and now Brian sat, and there was a strange feeling of silence and the thrumming and the roar of the engine, a strange feeling of silence and being alone. Brian was stopped. He was stopped, frozen. Inside, he stopped. He couldn't think past what he just saw, what he was feeling. All of it stopped. The very core of him, the very center of Brian Robeson was stopped and stricken with a white flash of horror and fear, a terror so intense that his breathing, his thinking, and his heart nearly stopped. Stopped. Seconds passed, seconds that became all of his life, and he began to know what he was seeing. He began to understand what he saw, and that was the worst. It was so much worse that he wanted to make his mind freeze again. He was sitting in an airplane roaring 7,000 feet above the northern wilderness with a pilot who had suffered a massive heart attack and who was either dead or something close to a coma. He was alone, alone in the roaring plane with no pilot. He was alone, alone. That's the end of chapter one. I hope that you liked it. Chapter two will be coming at you soon.